Well, hello, everybody. I'm Karen Denby, and I'm from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I'd like to welcome you and give thanks to everyone who's joining us for this third in our series of webinars for Interreach. I'd like to give a special thanks to webinar co-organizer Amanda McMillan, and thanks to Matt Hotz, who is providing Zoom so that we can actually have the webinar. So give Matt a hand. We're also open to new ideas. We're always open to new ideas about what to bring up for discussion and how to connect. So if you do have ideas, Amanda and I would love to hear them anytime, but especially today. We're having a moderated forum where you'll have an opportunity to start a conversation that's relevant to supporting our community of practice. Today's moderator, Dr. Christine Hendren, will lead the discussion and afterwards we'll also discuss some precursor activities for a workshop planned at the site's conference in June. So I'll now turn this session over to Christine. Thanks so much Karen and Amanda and Matt for facilitating this um, series to happen. This is great. Um, and I love what you said in the introduction Karen about this being really, uh, we decided to use this um, meeting of our webinar to throw the doors open to what everybody who's been taking the time to call in for these webinars would like to get out of this community. So um, I think we've had multiple events uh, both at the sites conferences and previous conversations through this webinar series where we've identified places where we overlap. Um, we also identified a bunch of sort of adjacent communities that exist that are thriving and much uh, more mature than our community. Uh, and I think we're all very cognizant that there are just a lot of resources out there, both through NORDUP um, and through the I2S community um, that we can draw upon, not try to duplicate, but try to align those resources with what we specifically would like to get out of this with Interreach, which of course is about uh, establishing a career path, establishing ways for us to um, create a community of practice that includes best practices, networks, a shared and elevated appreciation of the need for our type of a role in, across a number of different um, project areas. So with that, I'm just going to present a couple of framing slides, um, both to tee up our conversation and also to help for people who might be watching the webinar uh, later so they can have some context. Okay, so this is a brainstorm session and what I thought we could uh, focus around are, as Karen mentioned in her introduction, who are we as a community? What would we like to work on? And then I put in, on in this next year um, as a sort of a near term site to set. So we can think of what are the tasks we actually want to undertake? And what's realistic? Because I call this group a professional hobby. I think it's that for many of us. Um, so what can we realistically take on that we can knock out of the park that moves the ball down the field a little bit, but also is it unrealistic in terms of scope? Um, I thought we could talk about uh, what Karen mentioned that I would tee up some, uh, some content that we are going to cover in our workshop that will be held at the Orlando uh, Science of Team Science meeting this year. Um, and so that workshop is going to be focused around kind of brainstorming what are our shared versus distinct among our groups um, knowledge, skills, and dispositions in our community. This is something that Gabrielle Bammer did in the, um, in the uh, translational ecology community that was a really interesting exercise. So we thought we would uh, focus our half day uh, efforts on that. And, um, and then the last thing is your topics of interest. So um, I want everybody to contribute on all the things that I put up there, but also to say, hey, this other thing that's totally different is something I want to focus on today. So we've got time set aside for that. Um, quickly, I don't know if there's a way, um, uh, well, I know that there is a way. I'm looking, I wanted to see um, up front who is going to be, oh, there's a way if you look on your participants screen. I want to know how many of us are going to be at this year's Science of Team Science meeting. I know Matt Hotze is not going to be available. Um, I will be there. Can you, can you uh, maybe speak up or raise your hand if you are on this call but not attending that um, workshop? Okay, Holly is not going to be there. Amanda won't be there. Um, 
Okay, so I, I just wanted to get a sense. That doesn't have to change what we'll talk about, but um, I wanted to get a sense of um, the, uh, the idea that we want to capture in particular your input for the shared and distinct knowledge, skills, and disposition, um, and what you would hope to get out of that workshop so that we can represent you as part of our community within that uh, effort. Because what we'd like to do is maybe um, if we can get a white paper or even a, a perspectives manuscript someplace as a, a tangible work product that all of us could contribute to. Um, okay. All right, so this is just, um, let's see, maybe I can hide that. Okay, um, this is just to go over, I don't want to reiterate from the inaugural webinar uh, everything that I talked about, but I did cover three roles that are among those we identify as interdisciplinary integration research careers. Um, one is I2S, and so this is one of the established ones, Integration and Implementation Sciences. Gabrielle Banner wrote about this in her book, Disciplining Interdisciplinarity, which is free at the link below for anyone who doesn't have it. Um, multiple chapters apply to the type of role that we are talking about in, um, in the interreach community, uh, roles, I should say. Um, and her definition is, it's a new discipline providing concepts and methods for conducting research on complex real world problems, which sounds like us. Um, and it supports researchers called I2S specialists who contribute to cross-disciplinary teams. Now, the I2S role is known for being a researcher in the traditional tenure track sense. So they have more um, already sort of maturity to the definition of their success metrics. So, right, they have publications and they have proposals won. Um, this, is, uh, this is different from many of our roles, but the knowledge and the skills and often the disposition, I think, overlaps very heavily with the people who undertake this. So that's one community we want to draw from and include. Um, IES, um, oh, I did, I think I did this last time too and I have not fixed it. Okay, so IES, uh, nope, sorry guys. I think that every webinar I've ever given has some sort of reverse um, in it. So, okay, pretend that says AIS. Um, this is intended to just remember that there's an Association for Interdisciplinary Studies, which is um, 37 years old, 38 years old this year. Uh, and it's a professional organization founded to promote interchange of ideas that would be highly relevant to us. Um, it would be crazy for us to proceed without identifying this as a great resource. Um, they're a nonprofit uh, educational association. Um, Bill Newell, I believe, is the, is the current and longstanding executive director of this association and, uh, and a big contributor to this community. So we can draw from and include those folks too. Um, research development professionals of the NO, National Organization of Research Development Professionals um, is uh, founded uh, by Holly Krasinski, who we're lucky to have on the call today. Um, and this is a relatively new, but extremely well established already organization. Um, over 700 members, I think, after only nine years, but uh, clearly a need in the community that uh, coalesced around the idea to um, initiate and nurture critical partnerships and alliances throughout the institutional research enterprise and between institutions with their external stakeholders. Um, so this is everybody who helps, pr uh, traditionally has been helped promote and win research by creating connections and um, you know, core competencies and aligning everything from uh, incentives to talent base, um, but also as Holly is quick to say, Supporting and developing research does not have to be limited to drumming up money for it. It should also be developing the after the fact uh, post award process and improving science outcomes. So this community, we should engage and include and draw upon their expertise and also just not limited it to um, thinking of it as the pre award uh, <clears throat> participation. So IES is uh, the name that I had uh, kind of used to talk about the type of role that my particular role and many of you in this group is. Um, and so we call it a newly recognized class of professionals with specialized project management skills and boundary expertise um, in translating and synthesizing knowledge across disciplines to enable and improve science outcomes. This is very similar to an I2S 
and an RDP. The only thing is that it is um, the executive kind of indicates that it has an administrative or managerial or both component to it and is not only scholarship. Some IES roles include scholarship, so I still actively publish. Other IES roles do not, and maybe they have a more budgetary uh, role. So there can be a lot of different mixes of your functions, um, but a lot of times uh, you have a similar set of challenges where you need to be fluent in um, a, a field, at least adjacent to the fields that you're trying to unite. Um, and you often have to lead without authority. Uh, and so a lot of the shared challenges and um, shared metrics of success here too. Um, okay, so critical functions for the IES. I think that we uh, worked on um, for a chapter with Sharon Koo on this include epistemic functions, um, so what are the knowledge areas that you understand? Managerial functions, so what do you actually do to coordinate, facilitate, manage the, the enterprise, both on an interpersonal level and a behind the scenes, just make the plumbing work level so that the people in the knowledge areas can focus on the science. Um, and then interpersonal and emotional work. Uh, depending on the time of year, that may be the largest part of my workload. I'm sure that many of you all um, share this. So it's part of why we're suited to the job. It's part of why the job is important, but um, it often goes um, sort of under articulated, I'll say. So this, this is an opportunity for us to bring in some research on that and improve our best practices. Um, so overlaps and distinctions in these types of practitioner jobs, not that those are the limit to what uh, categories of practitioners there are that would be relevant to the inner reach community. Um, but if you if you take those three that we talked about, um, the I2S specialist, the RDP, and the IES, there are examples of how you can uh, both have overlaps and distinctions. Both, both of those categories of, um, you know, both overlaps and distinctions are helpful to talk about and, um, and distinguish from each other in order to define our community needs, um, our communities and our sub-communities. So something that we share with all, I think, are skills, knowledge, and disposition. Um, and that's why we are focusing our workshop on uh, our kind of listing out those, um, saying what we share and saying what would be helpful to build up best practices and communication around. Uh, maybe publication around, depending on what everybody's goals are. Um, and apologies for this arrow. I uh, made this over lunch. And so um, this just comes from, I guess this is just saying the community is coming from all over the world to join the RDP community, which has this 900 person membership. So things that are distinct with, within them, let's start with the um, research development professionals. Um, the institutional play, placement might be academic administration or a research development support across a number of different uh, enterprises. Holly herself is at Elsevier, um, and there are just plenty of different places where there, uh, there might be government, um, you know, uh, research administrators from an NSF or a funding body perspective, um, different folks that need to be involved and aware of this skill set and knowledge base. I2S specialist, um, regular rank, tenure track faculty. That's simple. Um, well, it's not simple to be that, it's simple to name it. Um, the role of IES, again, Alt Academia, it's a mix. That, uh, this, this is really emerging, I think, that we have known sort of um, inductively by example, okay, well, we have somebody who manages a national lab. We have somebody who, um, a couple people who manage, uh, you know, tenure, funding our uh, inner university centers. Um, so we're still kind of defining what that has to do. Um, we have different but overlapping in those three different circles, job activities, uh, specific transactional challenges, um, or uh, dynamic, the power dynamic challenges, um, differing duties such as budgetary or not, uh, scheduling or not, and then meeting design and facilitation. The types of things we're trying to accomplish on our short and long-term time scales may differ across these, even though they share the skills, the knowledge, and the disposition necessary to make that happen. Um, and this is just reiterating success metrics, institutional placement, and importantly, career trajectories are different um, across these roles. It's not always clear what is your next step 
Is this something you've organically grown into because it's useful at the time? Is there a way to build on it and so that your career um, is elevated to something that can uh, amount to a, a, larger, um, a larger picture? So, okay, now uh, I'll move to steps we can take together and I'll start by composing one. Um, I went ahead and just started down the road of creating a website um, because it was getting difficult to tell people about this and invite them to things um, and start from scratch with just a whole conversation each time or an email. So it's time for us to have a landing page. This I want to emphasize is a fledgling version. Uh, version. It's, um, I guess it's both. It's, uh, it's ready for your comment and um, would be happy to take directional comment or anything you want. So uh, this is just my first step and I'll take you to it in a second. Um, I'm looking for ideas for content, ideas for how to support it. Um, with some really helpful and uh, realistic feedback from Holly, I, I um, agree and kind of would like to say, I don't think we're ready to incorporate as a nonprofit um, I've been involved from an advisory board standpoint, but I have not myself incorporated one. I don't know that we have the uh, bandwidth, honestly, is the main, um, uh, I guess, thing that we're, we're lacking at the moment. But also, we, I don't know that we have enough of a shared vision for what it is that we would want to do as a nonprofit. Um, and so I, uh, let's see, okay. I want to make sure no one's trying to get my attention. Mm. Okay. Um, so anyway, this is to say, in the short term, let's just have a landing page and, you know, maybe there are ideas for how to support the maintenance of a website, which is about $240 a year. Um, so I'll take you to this now, somehow. Okay. Okay, that worked. I don't know what this thing is, but. Okay, so this is the InterReach website. It's interreach.org. The, the first thing I noticed, um, Matt, Hosey had the great idea to look at a Gordian knot for a logo, um, and I love that, but I also just realized that um, I2S, uh, and I'll take you to that website, I'll, I'll put it out for committee, but I, I think they might be a little bit close to this, uh, and so maybe we might have to think of something else, but um, so this is what I said. Research on complex problems requires integration of gross boundaries. Interreach is a community for the people who make that happen. Okay, that's our tagline. Um, this just describes what we're for. Um, this offers people a way to join us. So if they also want to be the arrow, that's not what I was hoping would happen. Um, that's supposed to be a live page. It worked earlier on a different browser, but now it knows you're watching. Um, okay, let's see if this one works. About the interreach community. Okay, also not working. That's unfortunate. Well, maybe I'll go to the um, the other site if we have time and you want to navigate around. But for now, just know I have um, on the join us page. It says um, uh, how people can sign up for our listserv. It, um, it will have a place to link to the webinars. Um, I think we should continue to post our webinars on the I2S uh, page as well just because that is an established community, more connections is better, and um, we wanna bring in people to our user community. Let's see if resources works at least. Okay, this one works. Resources um, is, is really just an attempt to not act like we're inventing a new wheel, to say, look, this is a narrow slice um, uh, with specific desires, drawing on communities that have already created a lot that we can um, both honor and utilize. So key resources and collabor collaborative groups. I want to put Nord up up here too. Um, I just got to throw these things up here this morning. Um, so I2S, IAS, and then Science of Team Science. Um, I'll look, maybe I'll ask Holly for very specific things we might uh, really want to link to within NORDUP, maybe the job bank if that's an easy post, um, that kind of thing. So this is just to say, hey, uh, here are things that we're drawing on. You should go here and, and look at their work. Also, do you do this? Do you work in this space? If so, why don't you enter your information? So all of this stuff is, um, like I say, a moving target, but I'd like the idea of us doing this here. Um, and although I was really interested in trying to utilize Trellis, um, I found it to be, quite honestly, just a, a, a hard, sell for people to get onto a new platform where they would need another profile, like a LinkedIn or a Facebook. Um, very open to diverging opinions on that, but I, I felt like 
if we said, hey, go to innerreach.org, see if this is you, and if you want to join us, that's, that's an easier sell to me. Um, okay, so that, that's that. Um, and then other next steps ideas. Uh, invite I2S authors for webinars. So when I was linking to all those resources, I just saw, look at all this great work. So check out this recent blog post on Gabrielle's blog. It's Successful Implementation Demands a great liaison person, nine tips on making it work. So this is all about stuff that we in this community do, right? Uh, be a champion, have credibility, have connections, social skills. I'd be interested in hearing somebody just present this type of thing. So that's one idea. Um, and then um, from there, uh, I'd love to come back to this and just take everybody else's ideas for what's a next step or some next steps we could do. The next slides I have, um, which I'll go backwards in a second, are just let's brainstorm if we get to that, if that's where the conversation goes and you all find it useful to, especially um, with Holly and Amanda and Matt not being at the, um, the June meeting this year, would love to hear brainstorm or resources that you suggest for um, capturing what are our shared knowledge, shared skills, and shared dispositional aspects with links to where they did this for the translational ecology community. Um, so that we can kind of use that to feed our, um, uh, our discussion that we're gonna have in June. So that's all I had prepared. So Christine, yes. so Christine, it's Holly. I just wanna, I raised my hand in, hand in affirmative. I will be at the conference. Sorry, I misunderstood and so raised my hand when I shouldn't. I got all excited and I am gonna be there though. I'm so excited. I was trying not to visibly be so sad. Uh, uh, you, you, were try, you were trying not to say out loud, what the hell, Holly? <laughs> I know. So that was really nice of you being so lovely about it when you thought that I was totally blowing you off. <laughs> but I will be there. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I tend to ask um, very simple questions in a convoluted way. So I'm sure that their hand raise was my too. Um, excellent. Okay. Well, we still care what you think now, too. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm going to go away from presentation view and start to act as a, a scribe for anybody that would like to um, uh, react at all uh, to anything that I've said or um, propose next steps ideas for our community. Um, so I cede the floor. Hi, Christine, it's Matt. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. Awesome. So great job on the website, by the way. I think it's a, a great start and that, and that platform is really flexible. So I think that'll be a good one going forward. So thanks for getting that set up. Sure. Uh, the, the other thing that I, I, I kind of wanted to frame, you know, thinking about this is like, you know, how, you know, when someone comes to interreach, what is their, you know, what is, what is interreach going to help them with, you know? And I think that we've, we've got that kind of on the, on the page here, but it's just, I don't know. I'm just trying to put myself in the frame of view of someone who's maybe been thrust into an interdisciplinary role and, what are their what are their first problems that they come across, uh, and how this uh, organization can kind of help guide them, provide resources to them, provide contacts for them. Uh, that's that's kind of where where my thoughts went when uh, you popped up the website. Great, yeah, that's fantastic to think about it from a who's our who's our target audience? Who is it that we want to? engage with and, and yeah because I think there's I think there's the, the group of people that are established and I think w maybe we haven't drawn all those people in but there's also those people that are like I mean I know this happens in the ERC program like people just say oh they're like well you've you're a, you, you are you know seemingly fitting into this role and maybe you have like more technical skills than managerial skills or maybe you have more managerial skills than technical skills or 
something along those lines of, you know, in terms of those different skills that you talked about, the three, the three epistemic and managerial and emotional interpersonal, uh, where do you, where, you know, oftentimes you have like one of those strengths or maybe two of them. And then there's, there's a, there's a piece missing because you really haven't done this before. So, I mean, I'm kind of speaking from personal experience here, but uh, that's, I don't know. Those are the things that came to mind. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm, I'm thinking out loud with typing right now so that if, if we did identify with those kind of areas, either, you know, knowledge, skills, dispositions, and um, organize our, our resources to the extent that it would make sense to do so by that Venn diagram, then maybe you come, maybe we could even have almost a, either you self-diagnose what you feel strong in, um, and then, you know, how do you help uh, bolster somebody's uh, areas that they feel out of their element in, you know, how do I dabble in management if I've never done that, or how do I uh, diffuse tense situations without authority if I've never done that, you know? Yeah. And I don't want to dominate discussion here, but I, I think one of the other things is in terms of resources, like it's not only the organizations, but it would be nice to be able to point to some examples of centers that are well run, you know, just to say, oh, let me click over and see what this center is doing, what their organizational structure is, what their, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of what the ideal is. So that, that may be a different audience. That might be people that are looking at, okay, what, you know, maybe it's a higher up at a university wondering, okay, how do we hire someone or how do we shape our, this new center that we're putting together in, in the most, um, in the most uh, ideal way, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just reacting. Um, okay. Do to meet these needs. Awesome. I love these. Um, and I think we have until this is an extra long. Um, the webinar is until two thirty. Am I right? If we need it. Um, so, yeah, that's correct. Okay. So yeah, as far as I, I think with our. Um, Nobody should worry about dominating. We, this is this is a great core team. So um, throw out everything you got. Um, Stephanie, I guess maybe I'll throw a question your way. Seeing the Venn diagram of different types of communities and also the, it's kind of. Everything works better in threes, I think, conceptually, but we don't have to be limited to that. But we've got these three types of buckets for roles to be in. We've got these three uh, uh, aspects that are shared, which are, you know, knowledge, although that can be different across the three roles too, knowledge, skills, and disposition. With that setup of uh, kind of framing our thoughts, does, does this give you ideas? Um, about toolbox involvement yeah can we go back to that slide sure okay so there are i think now three of us on the call who are in a potentially a fourth bucket mm -hmm. that might that has the shared with all skills but also has let's say more of the community like so i'm talking about the community engagement fellowship program that AAAS is running so Myself, Jennifer, and Alicia are all in the first cohort of that program. And the research component isn't necessarily part of that. And so that's why I might split it off into its own separate circle. But it still has that um, shared, I would say, shared with all boundary set. Great. Um, could you say it's Community Engagement AAAS Fellow Program? So it's Community Engagement Fellowship Program, I think is how they, so it's AAAS.org backslash CEFP. 
Um, would you say, because I, I did toy with, you know, when we, when we made InterReach a community um, in the listserv, just sort of as an outgrowth of the science of team science community that has both practitioners and then researchers, there is also this kind of meta level engagement where um, what, that we're also drawing from that I, I really only put practitioners in this group. And I, it sounds like at first I was thinking the CEFP group would be that meta level, but actually you're also kind of transcending, you're, you're creating the connections, right? Right. So I think what we saw last year in the workshop that I was in that you and Holly ran, I think Gabrielle was part of that too. Mm -hmm. um, was that there were some people who were connected to organizations also who maybe fit in a fifth bucket who had the organizational role but didn't have a researcher role so like they'd have like the managerial portion or they'd strictly be researched but it wasn't tenure track faculty but it was still in support of defining it so there may be these five buckets well, yeah. that, so that fifth bucket, the bucket you just described, I had kind of thought last year rolled within the IES, but okay. um, maybe tell me again why you think, um, because that's such a nebulous, it's like. Yeah, that's the, that's the one that I find a bit tricky. So that's the people who are working like in some of the organizations that are either academic connected or government um, that may not have the ampersand between managerial and research. Mm -hmm. but still be like the alt act career. So like you have a PhD or a master's and you're doing this in support, but and it's hard for me without looking back at like who was there to yeah. remember what organizations they were with. Yeah. I really feel like it's the, the IES role is shaping up. I mean, and we're defining all this to make sure that everybody has a place they can fit. They don't necessarily have to have a label, but you want to be able to see yourself in the big picture to say, oh, I belong here because of X, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, so we've got to figure out a way. Um, and I was going to say some of the CEFP members have research roles. So my job is still hybrid research managerial. So I actually see myself as an IES who also does community engagement. Hmm. And I think that that might be true for some of them, but then we have members who are um, strictly in professional organizations building communities, so doing their community engagement. Yeah. Um. But I think that this is where the toolbox workshop is gonna be fun because the prompts I'm already thinking about are things like, do we need these individual titles? Um, what counts as success for the practitioner jobs. How do we build skill sets? What are the necessary skill sets? Yeah. What does it yeah. look like to have the right disposition to be in this type of career? Yeah, and if you have sort of a kind of like a, I'm sure everybody's done some type of a strength finders or, you know, um, Myers Briggs or something where it's, if you can identify the dispositional traits that are advantageous, then you can, some you're just, naturally you have it or you don't. You have energy to deal with people or you don't, you know? But then some of it you can uh, augment or get better at or those types of things. So one, it was interesting when we were proposing the workshop for the, um, the June meeting, um, Holly, and Gabrielle, El, Holly, Gabrielle, and I talked about, you know, should we focus on the distinctions or the shared parts? And so um, we decided that we might end up, because like last year, there really wasn't another I2S uh, specialist other than Gabrielle, because I think she invented it and she's <laughs> the one. Um, and I would love to be one, another, the one, but someday, but I'm not. Um, and so uh, we didn't want to fracture the group into not uneven parts. Um, so we thought for this year, better to focus on what is it that we all share. And through doing that, I think we could also have people, um, you know, what, what we're hoping to do, what we proposed anyway, is to have um, randomized groups, small groups of a good size where you would brainstorm within your small groups. So you have no more of than four or five or so of those groups. Um, brainstorm the, the skills and knowledge and disposition and then have everybody report out to capture it. What could be great is um, 
if we also have them maybe before and after see where we're not, the body of the event isn't focused around the distinctions, but maybe we could find a way to use the toolbox before and after to figure out, okay, do you identify with one of these more, yeah. you know, and then see where the fault lines and, and like you said, the fundamental question, to what extent is it useful? I think for me, it's useful. So for instance, Matt and I have similar roles. It's really, uh, I could, I could learn from everybody here about the, the skills, knowledge, disposition, but then the very specific um, situations that we've had to navigate, maybe he and I would be able to say, oh, I've done this, or this is the, a, a similar thing. Our best practices might be more um, situation specific. Yeah. And that's where the rules, I think, can help. Um, and you know the, the balances that you're having to find uh, between all kinds of different constraints are probably specific to the roles more. Um, so I, I think that that would be great um, to have some kind of a, a, a mining this group for what should we do with these roles, even though we're not spending the half day on um, really listing them out yet. Yeah, and I think maybe that's some of what we can do some heavy lifting on too, is saying like, in a supporting science of team science role, X skill is the highest priority, rank one through five. For those of you who haven't done a toolbox workshop before, what we're going to do in this one in particular is have a common preamble. So come together, talk a bit about the process, and then we're going to split off into two separate differently designed workshops. One is going to be for people who are interested in questions of research questions about the science of team science and they're going to go off with Steve Crowley and the other one is going to be for people who are interested in roles that support science of team science so they're going to come y'all going to come with me and what I'm doing is trying to get input from the different communities to figure out what we can say about everything all together and then influence that other side um, the people who are doing the actual investigation or for some of us those of us who sit in both worlds. And so the idea is to bring both groups back together at the end and then have them talk um, a little in depth and together about how to build synergies between what the science is doing and what those in support are doing. But one of the other things we also do is we tend, we can run a survey after or before the toolbox workshops and then after this workshop, because I think right they span the two days if I, or the day, and then look at before and after effects on seeing if these were helpful for people to reframe um, kind of what, where their career falls or how they consider their skills or any of that. That's cool. So just to make sure I understand you, we would go, um, and I haven't, I think ours might be this, I don't know when our workshop is, but you're saying it's not concurrent. I specifically ask that they not be concurrent and that we come before you guys. Awesome. Just okay. to set you up. So that was the- And that is, and that is, and that is what happened. Yep. Wonderful. Hooray. <laughs> okay, great. That's really, that's really cool. Um, all right. Um, do, if, does anyone, I guess, Stephanie, is that, if you had more, I'm not meaning to move on early. Do you have more? Oh, no, that's fine. A big part of my day today was just observing and seeing, and this chart is really helpful for that, for Great. prompt building, so. Great. Um, so, you know, another thing could be, do you not see yourself on this, you know? Because we don't want to say, a priori, this is who is involved in the inner reach community. You know, we want, like Matt's saying, really thinking from a, a service standpoint, how how can we help other people? And then we're helping ourselves in the, in the process. Okay, how do I not? Okay. Sorry guys, I don't have a way to divert the call. But, um, so the website, maybe we could have some conversation around what you all feel about um, Trellis. I really like Trellis. It's a great platform. Um, I am not great at learning new technology. So I, um, I will say that up front, um, which I think I've said on every webinar, but I had some trouble um, with the fact that in order to upload documents, you have to put a keyword and then um, it can be associated with an event, but there's, um, there's, you can put any keyword you want. I think 
if I had more bandwidth for this professional hobby, I could go in and set some um, required ontology that would make you choose certain keywords. And I, they've thought of all that. And they're, they've got amazing technical support that's poured time into trying to make us understand how this works. So I'm extremely appreciative of that. But um, uh, I would love to hear from you if you think, hey, we should give that another try. It would help, it would leverage other efforts. Or if you think we should go this interreach.org uh, route, um, love to hear your thoughts on that because so far I've just kind of shot from the hip to try to get something moving. Um, but in doing that, I'm not trying to uh, be a dictator about it. So what do people think on that? Christine, I don't know if you're seeing the chat, but there's some stuff going on uh, where people are just typing. Oh, I just saw this. Okay, great. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you like the website, Holly. Okay, I'm fine. <laughs> um, okay. Um, let's see. So my sense is that, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm kind of biased towards the website, but I mean, just in our, our experience, my experience in our own center about like trying to create platforms and other things like that, it, you know, just getting our people used to the idea that we have a public part of the website and then a login part of the website where, you know, we keep things that are more uh, private, like budgets and, you know, things like that. The that has been a year and a half process just trying to get people like used to the idea of having to log in find information and to me to me the simpler that you can make especially for especially if you're, if one of the goals is to try to grow this community the simple you can get interaction to with with them the better i mean i'm all for tools and apps i use tons of them but you need to find a way to reduce as many barriers as possible and a natural way for people to find information is just to type it into a search box. And so that's, that's my sense of it. So do you think, Matt, that we could easily um, incorporate, uh, well, like one of the things we wanted to do was house documents, like maybe the slide set from any of these webinars, should anyone want to go over it? I think it's kind of tough to get stuff from slide sets, but um, links to anything we might want to share, resources. Um, I mean, I think that's relatively easy. I have to say I've never myself uh, administered a website before, but I'm, I just went through Squarespace, which is really easy. Um, you have now for like a week, so. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm a, I'm now a website administrator. <laughs> Um, so, I, yeah, does anyone have sad feelings about uh, or uh, uh, reservations, mm -hmm. if we don't want to go the emotional route, about uh, going away from Trellis? I, I'm asking this because I know the Trellis community has been very um, proactive in recruiting us as a, as a user community, and I would like to give them a, 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 a final answer so that they don't pour more efforts into us if we are not going to go that route. Um, but I don't want to make that call without uh, checking with you all. I'm going to, uh, this is Stephanie again, I'm going to pick on uh, my other fellows for a second because I know that they have something they'd like to bring up in terms of what uh, contributions for science of team science and potentially uh, content for the new website. Let's hear it. So my name's Alicia and I guess I'm the one that Stephanie's gonna pick on because we've been- I can, I can, I'm picking on both of you, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, Jennifer and uh, myself are both uh, in the CFP program with Stephanie this year as the sort of inaugural cohort. 
and the science and team science uh, conference in June has definitely been a conversation across pretty much all of the people in the cohort. So we're definitely interested in engaging with that sort of process. Um, and we're on this call partly to sort of catch up on, on you know, how interreach sort of defines these, these roles as sort of like, you know, so it was really interesting again to see that flow chart. And um, I do think it would be nice to provide that, for example, on, on your website so people can kind of process uh, where they fit in things and where they maybe feel comfortable or not comfortable and have some dialogue about that. We are planning to, I know Stephanie's gonna um, potentially submit an abstract for, for a panel, um, but we have another one that we're working on as well, where we actually were gonna kind of bring down this analysis of what the CEFP fellows do, have a, you know, sort of in-depth um, analysis of the job descriptions and skill sets and stuff like that that seem to be coming out of these uh, types of jobs and we were going to bring down some case studies on some of the things that people do and they kind of open it up for discussion in terms of sort of sort of how we fit into that broader thing so it pretty much exactly fits into the end diagram that you already had and the idea is that we want to try and sort of institutionalize this role um, and the idea I guess in the science community that's different than in the corporate sort of level community of community engagement managers is a lot of us either support scientific societies um, and so that could be more of a support role, um, but there's also a lot of people that really help support communications um, for scientific collaborations. And so a lot of us have backgrounds in the particular field of science that we're working in. Uh, and we've just sort of done this like all act career thing where we uh, have some of the, I guess, personality traits that are required to deal with people, scientists included, um, that we find are much more successful than bench work, for example. So. Uh, I know that uh, Jennifer's been in communication um, with some of the people on the Science for Team Science Committee, and so we're sort of hoping to come down and actually have this kind of conversation. Uh, and we're, her and I are sort of tossing around which one of us can go, but we, there will be um, Lou Woodley from AAAS and Chellis that will be going, um, and we also have another team member, Andy, that will be joining for sure. So. And I've sent out, um, I've actually asked Michael to send out to the organizers of the Science of Team Science Conference if people can Zoom or Skype in as well so that more from the cohort, um, in case it's a financially limiting problem, um, can join for that as well. Awesome. Thanks, Seth. So I'll just, I'll tell, this is Holly and I'm on the committee. I think the answer is going to end up being no um, for cost reasons. Mm -hmm. I, I have a feeling that with the venue, it's going to end up being cost prohibitive to do that. But I'm glad you asked, but I just brace yourself for a no answer. You know, one thing in, with regard to that too, I check with um, Amanda and Karen if she's um, back. For, I know she had to step out for a second, but um, it seems like that topic is specifically of community engagement um, managers, the, the, both the fellows program and the more institutionalized ongoing career, um, that could be a great webinar topic. I know Gabrielle's gonna be next month, but uh, we could we could throw it out for a future one. What do you think, Amanda? Yeah, no, I think that's definitely a great idea. I also liked your idea earlier, Christine, about um, mining the I2S website for potential speakers um, based on their authorship list. So lots of good fodder there as well. You know, I bet if we did that and um, something, another uh, another community that um, I believe that's been really fun to watch grow over the years is in nanoinformatics. So really targeted mm -hmm. data integration. And what we do now um, for our webinar series is, uh, well, we meet way too much, but what we do is we fill half of the slots with speakers ahead of time so that we have a, enough of a user base that people say okay this thing is a real thing it's going to keep happening and then the other mm -hmm. half we have as working meetings um so i'm not mm -hmm. proposing that that ratio has to be the same but i wonder if that could be useful of booking people out especially people who are going to be probably busy and this is uh, a side you know a professional hobby for them we could book that yeah. out for the rest of the year almost with those types of people and then stay a little flexible for stuff like um, you know, the fellows who are saying, hey, I think this could be a really good community, but let's spend one session talking about our role. Maybe the next open session, we build out the website together in a working meeting, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a great idea. 
I think today's format, with having it be more of an open discussion, has been productive so far. So it's definitely a worthwhile um, model to, to replicate going forward. I have a question for you all in the fellowship program. When you say that you're supporting communications, um, are you talking about, uh, and it may be both, internal crosstalk, or are you talking about translational science communication to the public or uh, writing for different audiences that are not science-based? Uh, this is Alicia. I would say it's probably all of the above. Um, there's definitely, within the group of people, there's definitely ones that do both. Um, there's a lot of, I guess for more, it's sort of the society stuff, it's sort of within that realm, but there's a lot of people that are also trying to do local community stuff. I think Jennifer can probably speak to that. And then there's sort of the other end where it's um, even like just getting into the data and actually making the data more um, translatable in its own right. So I think it's the full spectrum of the group. And this is uh, Jennifer, I um, just to reiterate, yeah, so my role is I facilitate communications among researchers, I facilitate communications between researchers and community members, and then also just the external kind of marketing and communications of our group to connect with the public and connect with um, potential members. So it's, it's pretty broad. So could you give me an example, I'm curious, what, when you say you facilitate communications between researchers, what does that look like? Do you set up meetings? Do you put them in the same room and kind of translate? Or how, how does that translate to tasks? Yeah, um, definitely meeting organization and facilitation um, and just kind of moving the conversation along. We, you know, the, one of the barriers to these collaborations we're trying to get going um, in my um, program, which is about urban research, um, is just <laughs> logistical. <laughs> so getting people in the same room together and, um, and then helping, you know, helping them move their conversation forward so that the collaboration happens. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I would chime in and say that mine is even bigger translational in just in the science fields in the sense that like I have um, people that go in the field and collect samples and then I need to communicate what that looks like to the people that are building and have infrastructure for big data. So, um, you know, the guys behind the computer don't know what a, a CTD cast is on a ship, for example. So there's a lot of translating how sample turns into data and data turns into analyses. And um, so it's a, a, across a broad range of, of researchers in that sense. How, what, what initiates your involvement in both parts? So, um, like, how, how does it come about that you're talking to the data integrators and the samplers? Do they expect to be hearing this from you, or are you kind of offering um, an intervention because you're, you happen to be around? I'm just curious if it's built in to your job just responsibilities, or is it something that you saw a need for and are meeting the need organically? that question make sense? Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely more on the organic side. And that's, I mean, my job description was basically written and may or may not be useless at this point because nobody actually knew what we needed to do. So it's very much figuring out where the pain points are. And then my job is to figure out how to fix those. Um, and so like the community engagement fellows program is super interesting to me because I, f I feel like these roles need to be better defined for them to really kind of be more effective. And I, you know, you mentioned in sort of this conversation about um, having issues uh, of managing without having any top-down control or something. I forget the wording that you said, but um, that definitely happens on a regular basis in our jobs, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say mine was also organic, but I'm now probably more on the businessy end of the fellow. So I went from being a researcher with Toolbox to now being the program manager who manages the project about business strategy and community engagement with regard to client development. So some of us also play those roles in terms of translating the research into actionable client lead aggregation lead development. Yeah, 
that kind of that kind of fun uh, translational work. Um, so something I had not, I thought of it in the context of um, it working really well for the particular center that I lead, but um, I also, you know, in the back of my head, I have wondered if it would be a, not universal, but a broadly shared overlap is, um, this idea that a person in our role in the move toward a uh, big data obsession, even in communities like my community of nanomaterials, we don't have big data, we have broad data, but everybody wants to do big data. And so at the stage where you have broad disparate data, you need more communication than ever to try to get people harmonizing, hey, let's take the same parameters in our scientific experiments or when we measure this particular thing, let's use this method so we can compare in the back end. So I wonder if a particular um, focus area could be the, the data implications of a boundary spanning interreach career. And I think that that could be one hook. I don't want it to dominate, but it could be one hook that monetizes a career like this because it's a pain point that everyone has um, the, especially from the funding agencies, I, I, a talk I gave this morning was kind of about this. They know they want data and they know they are going to require you to share your data. Um, and when you ask what that means, they say everything. And when they ask, when you ask how, they say manage it. So it's very fuzzy. They need someone to figure out what they need. Um, and I think that our community often overlaps with who should be doing that and how far upstream we need to teach everyone that we are. We're, we're 40 steps ahead of where they were when we were able to sequence the genome because that was a very um, mature area where they said, all you have to do is everybody do these tests on these four proteins one billion times and then combo it. And I know not to minimize how amazing that was, but a lot of our evolving complex projects are not at that, um, that level of repeatability and automation yet. And so it takes a lot of, you know, softer management skills of the communication. So what do you all think about kind of uh, putting that forward as a touchstone for one area where this is really needed? And could we profile certain areas like problems that are common to enterprises, back to Max's point, um, you know, this is something that our people are in a position to help with, which doesn't have a ready-made solution yet. Can I chime in one thing again? This is Alicia. Um, I think that's obviously as a data person, I think that's fantastic. Um, but in the context of this role, I really want to make sure that uh, the culture of open science um, and how you actually do that cultural change and get people to want to share their data and archive their data and have standards um, is also probably is equally difficult of a challenge to a certain level. So. Yeah. Um, are you guys aware there's a there's a, a series of meetings called the Open Scholarship Initiative. Um, they're just having, I guess, next month their second of ten. Um, but it's it's about that topic, which brings together people from um, journals and academic administration and really data decision makers, uh, funding agencies that are designing their data management plans um, about how do you shift how knowledge is shared and what, how do we shift the incentives to make that align with what people's behaviors actually are. So if anybody's interested in that, I can, um, I can, it's, it's called OSI. Um, that might be of interest to this group. Hey, Christine, that does, this is Matt, this, that does sound very interesting actually. And I think that, I mean, you could even make <clears throat> data collection kind of even broader than just the, experiments or you know whatever gene sequencing whatever you want it, the example is I think data collection in like for example in our program we are required to report a lot of things and many many things uh, that are like what are the associated projects with your project and who is you know the leader of that project and how much is that project worth and how, oh, your student graduated. What did your student go to a industry member? So, I mean, there are, there are a lot of issues with just 
lowering barriers to collecting information in general so that it's not just such a, a burden to the to the people that are trying to function in the center i know that's a huge pain point for us like trying to come trying to set up systems to collect the information and to get people to participate in that because <clears throat> For example, for our program, it's like the NSF wants to show that we're getting both multipliers out of what their original investment is. So multipliers meaning associated projects that are like from other funding agencies or sponsored projects that are from our industry members. And tracking those things is not trivial. Uh, and getting people to understand that that's important to track because those those things feed into bigger reports that end up going to you know in front of the legislators for example to kind of show okay here's the collective impact of this interdisciplinary research um, so I, I think that I think it's related uh, it yeah. just something to think about I think it's even broader than what the just the just the research part. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I'm trying to capture kind of what you're saying as far as like, you know, enabling sharing of information um, with lowest possible burden on the researchers. Um, I'm putting this in our, a shared knowledge area. I mean, I think all of us have kind of a, a appreciation that comes from living at the interfaces of these things. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Holly being at Elsevier, I, I feel like that's also a, a strong direction that's driving these changes. Actually, a group of us are writing a paper right now. Well, okay, writing is, we have outlined a paper for quite a while and we're doing some team lit review on data sharing incentives um, and how that- Oh, hey, I have, I have a whole Mendeley folder, like a really comprehensive one. I'll you send you an invitation right now. Christine. Thank you so much. I think you and, said you and it's um yeah, so on data sharing, so I because that is something I've been working on uh, and in my Elsevier role. I'll I'll send you it right now. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay. So I didn't hear any pushback on moving away from Trellis and moving toward an interreach website, correct? Um, definitely open to it if there was such pushback. Um, another topic, um, let's see. Um, I guess as far as website management, um, are there people who want to contribute content? Um, and if so, does any of you have experience with team building of a, of a website? You know, how does that workflow work? Well, what, what should we do there? So this is Holly. My recommendation for this is that you have um, maybe one or two people who are primarily responsible for uh, actually posting and how the website will look and where information goes. And then you can have a workflow or a, pro a set of processes in place where people can send information on the content um, and or uh, URLs, links to other resources that they'd like to see added and can make recommendations. You actually don't want too many people working on the website. It's the quickest way to have lots of things. You know, somebody, you just made a set of corrections. Somebody else comes and uncorrects yours or changes. And you're like, no, I wanted it that way. So it uh, tops one or two people um, who are who are pretty proficient at that. And um, I will now unvolunteer myself because I'm actually not very proficient at it. Right. I will, however, volunteer to be part of a group of people who identify some resources that can be added 
um, any information that could be put there. That would be wonderful. I, it's something I want to, I, I have a, a strong design aesthetic that in my manual analog life, um, I would love to have more ability to make that digital. Um, so I'm happy to be one of the one to two. Um, and then uh, do you have, um, Holly, since you've got such good experience, do you have advice for, should we use the listserv as a way for people to just uh, share things that they think should be content on the on the website or a smaller um, more targeted way of funneling information for people to suggest? no i think to i think to start i think to start because the group is still pretty small right um that actually that's the it's a great way to get people to look at the site because if you're asking people for some input you're you'll have a better chance of them clicking through to that link than if you just say hey there's a new interreach site um and, and the reason I said it besides, it turns out that the interreach domain is blocked by Elsevier security. I don't know why. I, I can get to all sorts of like sites I should never be on, on a company background. Um, so I'll request to get that off. But, um, you, you, but because I know you want some input, I'm motivated to go to my IT group and say, unlock this link. Unlock this domain for me. I need to be able to see it. So I think you'll have a better chance of people clicking through if you offer them the opportunity to engage versus just click and look at a web page um, because then they'll deprioritize that. So definitely do it. We don't have that many people on the listserv. It's um it's a pretty involved group and sharing has gone well. Um, I don't think it's going to be too much. Now, what you might want to do is not have responses go back to the full listserv because then it's going to get really busy and most of us don't want to see that. So what I would recommend is that all of the feedback go to the one or two people directly or the one person who compiles it all and then shares it with the other person who's also going to help put it on line that would be the best approach so invite via the listserv for input but request the feedback to come specifically to an individual and not back to the whole listserv so smart christine i need to find this tool but there may be a way of getting people to literally be able to mark like mark up the website and just send you like a link to say uh, here is a section because it can get a little confusing uh, where what people are talking about yeah. so I think there's a tool out there that I, I need to check into this but I think there's a tool out there where people can actually like go to a certain part of the website and kind of like draw you know literally like write on it and then send it to you so that you can see exactly where they're, what they're talking about. Uh, but I'll, I'll check into that. That might be helpful for this, for this purpose because yeah. it, it could get a little confusing otherwise. That sounds awesome. I want the whole world to be track changes version of like, yeah, like, that's, that's perfect. Um, you guys are making me think of, um, um, am I able to? Okay. All right. Uh, oh. All your all your pages work for me though, Christine. I, I'm I'm just Rice University though, so they let me do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't work at I don't work at a publisher anymore. <laughs> Right, I know. I was thinking actually of your role. Um, so Matt was the managing editor of multiple journals, um, ACS journals for a while, and uh, I was thinking that your role the similar. I think we've got somebody. Hey, Jack, would you be able to mute? We we can just hear background office noise a little bit. Oh, I thought I was. Hi. Oh, we're happy to have you. Um, I um, yeah. Perfect. Um, I have it turned up really loud, so that might just be me. Okay, well, I interreach.com, somebody, um, Amanda, you had found that this was a, I guess maybe it's no longer, um, but it, I was worried that interreach might be something that we had trouble with because um, there was an example of uh, like an Australian community for, elderly people or something like this that was interreach but dot com i have i don't think it uh, i guess it's not coming up so maybe it's not a problem 
Yeah, that I don't think that was me who had any problems with it, although I'm intrigued about the Australian senior group. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe, let's see. Okay, um, Interreach Family Center. Um, so this is already a thing. Is that a problem? I don't know that it is. Um, I know there are plenty of different times that the same word is used. Uh, but I, I didn't want to bring this up now. I think it's fine. Okay. I can't imagine there will be much overlap. Because <laughs> people are probably going to type interreach science or interreach team or, you know, and eventually, yeah. the, eventually search engines will, will sort it out for you. <clears throat> it will. So once you, once you get it up and we'll all like type it into our Google, you know, like a hundred times over the rest of this week, and yeah. that'll help to raise its profile. But also the fact that you picked the .org, um, right, which was really, really important, so thank you for doing that. That matters quite a bit. Um, I, you know, I think that as long as there wasn't anything else in that domain, it doesn't look like there's anything closely related. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always weird names for things and overlap, but um, I wouldn't worry about this at all. Wonderful, I was hoping you two would you would know if it was like, uh oh, that's a red flag. And, um, so one other thing I want to get your take on, since we're all having a community powwow. Um, I was so excited, although um, you know, I I completely um, cop to having made our uh, made our stand in um, logo on PowerPoint because I couldn't find a Gordian knot that was uh, that was Photoshop worthy. Um, but let's see. Okay, that's not what I'm trying to do. Ah, this is what I'm trying to do. But then look at Gabrielle's. This is pretty much a multicolored Gordian knot. What do you all think? Is that too close? I, I want to ask her too, um, mostly. But uh, do you think we should look for a different, um, a different concept for our logo? No, I think, I think you're, I think you're good. I think. Um, I2S is the problem that there's looks too much like alt metrics um, and, and that's different. It's sort of the, the, the wisps around a circle. It's mm -hmm. a little different. I, I like what you have for interreach and I don't think at all. Like if you, without you saying anything, if you just showed me that and I, I would never have thought the two looked alike. Awesome. Okay, perfect. I liked, um, you know, I was thinking kind of puzzly stuff, and then Matt had the idea. That, you know, already not. I like the idea that it's uh, it you can it's inextricably linked, and they all depend on each other. And so that then and, and it's also pretty clean. So okay. Um, and as uh, my my boss likes to say, and it 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 gets me through many different things because this is a professional hobby for all of us, if it's close enough for jazz, then, um, then we go with it. So in, until, I might not put more energy into a different and improved logo unless you guys say, oh gosh, that's an eyesore. So. Um, Don't spend too much time on the logo. It's just, it's fine. <laughs> so uh, we've got 13 minutes left. Um, we didn't, uh, uh, you know, I think people captured a lot of next steps in um, addition to website thoughts. I think that it's all kind of together, right? Like things that we want to put together as resources on our website are also steps we'd like to take. Um, inviting I2S authors for webinars is something. Um, maybe uh, keeping some percentage of the webinars um, uh, open and flexible to be working groups. Uh, um, that's a good thing. Um, we brainstormed shared knowledge. I put the data issues in there. That's an aspect that we can share. It's maybe specific to some roles and not others, but I do think it's probably in, in the broader sense of the term data that Matt was championing. I think that it's, it is probably universal to all of our roles in, in some way. Um, I wonder if there's a good way to offer this up for, um, for anybody to send an email either to 
uh, the listserv, what I could offer to do is send um, a, an email with action items for our group to the listserv after this as a way to get responses so that if people want to uh, tell what skills, dispositions, and um, knowledge that they'd like to share um, that are part of that Venn diagram, then they can send those in. Um, or, I don't know, that might be kind of tough to capture everything we mean by that in an email. So maybe I'll just tell you all as an action item, if you want to send me something, I'll incorporate those into the slides here. And then when they're shared um, as a file, uh, separate from the, the webinar link that's shared, then um, I'll incorporate your thoughts into this. Otherwise, it'll just be TBD, and we'll fill it in in June. Um, any other... Uh, action items. I'm trying to make sure I'm cap capturing what you guys think. Um, other next steps ideas. Matt to check on resources for track changes, um, suggestions on website. Uh, and then let's see. Okay. Can't type while people are watching. Then Trellis. Um, I think we're going to tell them until we hear um, uh, otherwise that, you know, we're going to make our own website. We're putting energy into creating that space and we're very thankful for their ideas um, and their help. And uh, I think it's just too much of a heavy lift right now. Um, moving toward website instead. One thing, um, do you all have experience of monetizing the website. Uh, Matt, I know, had suggested a very small uh, donation. Um, we Again, we're not going all the way to the point of becoming a uh, nonprofit right now. Um, but uh, what do you all think? Um, do you think people would donate $5 to be part of it? Is that uh, I mean, we could have it like Wikipedia style, um, where it's people in this community that are like, I think that this deserves to live. I will throw in fifteen dollars. Um, I don't know. Uh, so no, I think I think instead, because if you're trying to build a community, you need to have be thinking about sustainable support for things. I would actually seek some sponsorship to okay. begin with, and and the way that you would do that is an organization that might align with this group. Um, and then might be, uh, and then the concession is that on the website someplace that says sponsors and they get to have a little blurb as a founding sponsor or something. Um, and so, and you're not looking for like huge amounts of money to begin with. So, uh, and I'm happy to talk with you about how we did that for Nordup when I started okay. that organization. And, um, and now I'm on the other side and how organizations make requests to a corporate entity for support. So I think that's more time though than we have left for today uh, on this call. So Christy, maybe yeah. you and I can take it offline and, and speak in more detail on that. Perfect. I think that's a great idea. And I have one um, offer standing for, that was if we needed to pay for a trellis membership. Um, and, and maybe we, I had not thought of that actually. That seems silly now. Um, so yeah, I would love to take it offline and see, see what you think from that. Um, great idea. Um, just a question on that and just, um, in terms of how to handle that, because I don't, you know, I want to make sure if, if Christina's paying, well, has fronted the money for this website, then, then we get a sponsorship coming in. Now, how does that work from a tax perspective is another is a whole another issue so I don't know I, I know we don't want to go into a you know I no don't no I know that's why I said I'll that's why Matt I said I'll talk with Christine about how to do it because when I started Nordup we yeah. weren't a 501c3 organization and yeah. the first sponsor check that I got had to be yeah. put into a university account but it's it's but lots of things are possible to be able okay. to do it, you don't have to be a 501c3 organization in order to get sponsorship. The, the sponsor at the time just didn't want it to go into my own personal checking account. Um, yeah. And so they were willing to wait 
three weeks while I figured out where the check could go. So look, I mean, even in the, I mean, literally like they handed us a check and I go, how long do I have before I have to cash it? I had no place to put it. So I, I've already yeah. been through this. Um, I'm glad you and, have and really well versed on what is and what isn't allowable before you're a 501c3. And the good thing about universities is that they have mechanisms for this um, for other reasons, but also in support of things like professional societies when individuals great. at the university are part of them. That's great. Great. I'm glad you have experience in that. Yeah. So, so I'll, so what it can't happen is like, you know, somehow you then have to make sure Christine, you get, reimbursed but but there's some flexibility about where things go and no we don't have to be a 501c3 yet and besides you want to secure sponsorship before you'd ever want to go down that route because you really want to have a lawyer to help and that will cost on the order five thousand yeah. dollars to do in order to do it right and to do it one time through because the irs is is really a tough cookie yeah um wonderful i'm we're we're thrilled that you <laughs> have already worked out all the pain. And then, and, then, and then let me just say up front so that there's no questioning later. I'm not actually volunteering to lead that part of anything because I've <laughs> done that once. But I will happily advise, provide guidance, share what I learned so nobody makes the same mistakes. Uh, but but um, it was a beautiful life experience, and I'm glad I've had it. Um, and I, I wish I, w I wish it now on somebody else. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, that's perfect. And I think it, uh, we've got some time before it presents itself as the obvious next step. I think the, the website showed up on the scene as, hey, it's time for this. And so we can kind of take it from there. Um, uh, thank you so much, Holly. So, uh, okay. Um, does anybody have anything to say? We have five more minutes that they want to get either read into the record here as a next step or um, something that they hope comes out of future webinars or uh, anything else before we kind of close out. Well, this is Amanda. I would just like to make a pitch for our next scheduled webinar, which will be on Wednesday, April 19th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and I think, as Christine mentioned earlier, um, we'll be having a um, discussion on the discipline of integration and implementation science led by Gabrielle Bammer. So that should be um, something to look forward to. Wonderful. Um, then... Um, I guess I can coordinate with you, Amanda, and, um, and Karen as well for how to uh, follow up from the webinar to the broader listserv. Um, we do have over 125 members now. Um, and so one thing I would like to say is if you all have things, um, I know Holly in particular is really good about doing this. I, I often um, cross post, but I know that that might be kind of double hitting people, which I am sorry to do to their inboxes um, from the science of team science, but please feel free to use the website. We can reach out to each other. We can have, um, you know, ideas for when to check out different resources or even just open questions. Hey, has anybody had to go through joint budgeting process? So hopefully it can be as conversational as, uh, as we want it to be. I don't think it's been abused at all. Um, and so feel free. I, I don't have the moderator thing activated because it hasn't been an issue. So uh, you, you can post to the group without permissions. Um, just once you remember it's open. So um, utilize that and then um, I will either myself or Karen and Amanda and follow up to this webinar. I'll, I'll make sure to put out the word that um, people can uh, look at and provide commentary to the website. Um, uh, maybe I'll get it a little bit, I'll figure out what's going on with those pages I couldn't get to, but. Um. Sounds good.